Welcome to Happily Ever After is just the beginning. Keeping your relationship not just together, but happy, and we mean truly happy, is part art and part science. You've come to the right place. Here's your host, Leslie Dorries. Throughout my career, and probably if I'm honest, throughout my life, I've always had a problem with extremes. This is probably because I think things are much more complicated. Is it nature or nurture? My answer, yes. I tend to see most things as being on a continuum instead of just one way or another. And I like to say that there are only two absolutes. You're pregnant or you're not, and you're dead or you're not, unless you happen to be a believer and fan of the Princess Bride, and then you can be mostly dead. So what does any of this have to do with relationships and marriage? Well, basically, it's about the battle of the sexes, or more specifically, the focus on masculinity and femininity. Femininity. Are these actual characteristics or just social constructs? doesn't even matter. And I think that the Me Too movement and the current focus on toxic masculinity make this a necessary discussion. And in my view, it's too easy to talk about all men or all women. I'm a proponent of individual differences that none of us are all anything. So I wanted to address this topic, and I don't think I could have found a better guest to have this conversation with than Jonathan Church, an economist who has a penchant for writing. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on the show to talk about this timely topic. You got it. Thanks for having me. So part of the reason why I started thinking about this and why I wanted to talk to you specifically is that you wrote a really interesting piece for the Good Men Project titled Stoic, Toxic, or More Confusion that took on the recent focus on what appropriate, quote-unquote, masculinity. And you talk about the difference in your article between emotional restraint and emotional repression. What's the difference and why does it matter? Um, so I think that uh, when we talk about this issue about traditional uh, masculinity, um, for instance, in the APA guidelines that came out a month or a couple of months ago, and generally about so-called uh, toxic masculinity um, more generally, whether we're talking about the Gillette commercial or just really any venue in which we're talking about norms associated with masculinity. Uh, one of those norms uh, that gets talked about um, over and over is the idea uh, that men are not com comfortable uh, talking about emotions in some way or another, that they have a tendency to repre repress their emotions, they're not comfortable coming to terms with them, uh, being open about them, being vulnerable, you know, that sort of thing. Uh -huh. And one of the consequences is that stoicism tends to get uh, a bad reputation or a bad name or it's just not looked upon uh, favorably. And in some sense, that's because we have a kind of traditional sense of what it means to be stoic, which is that we repress our emotions. Right, the and traditional stiff upper lip of the British Empire, right? That's right. And I think that stoic, and I think that if you look into what stoicism ultimately is about as a philosophy, um, and I'm talking about to one the, the Greek Stoics, and then later more modern, say the uh, Dutch, Dutch philosopher Spinoza, uh, whose philosophy can to some degree be traced back to the Stoics. Um, you're talking about something different, which is emotional restraint. Uh, and to flesh that out, I would think about it more in terms of actually understanding emotions. Where the idea okay. is that the idea is not that you repress emotions, but that you're able to acknowledge them as sort of part of the natural order of things, that they're there. And so in some sense, there's a compatibility here between Stoicism and the larger conversation of the 21st, 21st century about so-called traditional mas masculinity that stoicism is not, in fact, something that we need to overcome or that we need to sort of uh, argue against, but in, some, but in, in, in a large sense is very compatible uh, with... So it, uh, it, it sounds like you're talking about... Um, it, 
more going back to the question about emotional restraint versus emotional repression, I almost talk about it as like being emotional reactivity where we, we feel these emotions, whether you're a man or a woman, you feel the emotions, but then you don't know what to do with them and they kind of yeah. overpower you. And so I think what you're talking about um, and the APA guidelines may, may have muddied the water here about the difference between repressing emotions, which is just trying not to feel them because they're so uncomfortable, I don't know what to do with them, and emotional restraint where I feel them, but I'm now making a choice as to what I want to do with them. Is that kind of in the right ballpark? It's in the ballpark. Um, So a Stoic, uh, Marcus Aurelius or Seneca or whatever, would say, well, Let's just say that my father just died. Uh-huh. Uh, do I sort of get all out of sorts and, and you know, cry and, 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 and uh, mourn and, and, and just sort of uh, go through some, you know, I don't know, stages of grief, grief or whatever? Or do you sort of step back and say, well, look, I understand that this is a sad event, uh, that uh, it's regrettable. But I also understand that there are hundreds, thousands, millions of people who go through the same event, uh, you know, whether every day or a month or, you know, whatever it is. But this is part of the natural order of things. And in some sense, that really helps to accept that death does not discriminate, that this is not something that you need to take personal, uh, that this is just part of life. Death is part of life. And I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's easy enough to say that, whether that helps somebody come <laughs> to terms with that, um, you know, that depends on the individual and their perspective and their maturity and, and so on. And obviously it's easier said than done. But, and, and that's why I don't say that sto- stoicism is necessarily something that's easily conveyed or easily cultivated. But par- properly cultivated, uh, you are able to reconcile to things that are inevitable. And, you know, we all sort of have our tragedies in life. Um, I have a friend who's just gone, you know, recently gone through surgery, uh, a, a cousin who died of, uh, of alcoholism and, um, and just other sort of personal um, or fr- family-oriented sort of tragedies. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, um, he and I have a similar outlook on this thing, which is somewhat of a shoulder shrug, which is, not to say that it's not like that you're indifferent to it, but that you just sort of come to understand that this is, I mean, it's, it's happened and you have to be able to acknowledge it and not necessarily sort of ignore it, but be able to also sort of carry forward with it um, uh, and just understand that there's nothing here to take personal. Yeah, I mean, and that's really... So it's, it's about the management of, of your emotions. It's about being able to, to, perspect, to, to develop a, a mature uh, perspective on the matter um, and not sort of let your emotions sort of take over you as opposed to allow your reason and your perspective to guide. So I guess that's the way to say it is that you want to be able to guide and manage your emotions and not your emotions guide and manage you. Right, because, and I, and I think just the, the discussions that you're talking about, and I know you mentioned the stages of grief, which I think is, is part of that process that, and I think people, number one, go through it at different speeds, and maybe uh, grounding in the stoicism philosophy would make people, would help people go through it faster, but it is part of making sense of what basically is inevitable, because I haven't figured out anybody who gets out of life alive. Um, you know, it's going to happen. And of course, yes, we could be upset about whether or not, you know, a child dies, which of course is not the nature of things. As parents aren't supposed to bury their children. That's not the natural order of things. Um, or if somebody dies young of, you know, some, some illness versus somebody who's 90 years old or 100 years old who's had a good life and, you know, that's, that's just the natural order of things. Um, I do think that that's an interesting thing, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the APA um, 
new guidelines, which of course I have, I have a whole series of issues with some of the guidelines that have come out recently. But this idea, because I remember having this client, I remember working with this couple, and she was, unfortunately, they had a miscarriage, and she was tremendously upset. She was crying. You know, she was she was quite emotional. One because that's you know pregnancy ending of pregnancy hormones and all those kinds of any things anyway are a little crazy on the body but she had she had convinced herself that because her husband did not cry he didn't care and i went whoa 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 <laughs> because she was using her own personal um experience as the standard by which grief was was judged was whether or not you cry and i think you talk about this a little bit in your article or maybe not this one, another article I read by you about these, the APA guidelines and what, what they're saying and the problems that they might be causing. Can you elaborate a little bit on those? So one, uh, I wrote an article for the Good Men Project uh, a year or two ago on why I'm a man who chooses not to cry. So that's, mm-hmm. defini- that's directly uh, relevant. Um, and basically the idea behind that was that crying just didn't help me. It just mm-hmm. struck me more as an outpouring of grief without a sort of rational uh, uh, mind to serve as a kind of pilot and guide you through um, uh, whatever it is that you're going through. In other words, when I cry and I finish fr- crying, I don't feel any better. And so it's in many ways, I feel worse and I don't feel like anything's been resolved. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so my own personal approach to this is I sort of, I'm just able to acknowledge that something worth mourning over has happened, but I am more focused on putting it into perspective and learning how to sort of adapt to uh, uh, adversity as opposed to essentially, um, and essentially just succumbing to grief. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with crying. It's just not for me. It's, mm-hmm. it's, not, it's not something that I find constructive. It's not something I find helpful. Now, uh, others may do, and I, I really can't relate to it. Um, uh, but at any rate, that was the, the point of, um, of that article. But to get back to the APA uh, guidelines, um, one of the uh, uh, messages is uh, that there are these sort of aspects of so-called traditional masculinity, like uh, uh, competitiveness, aggressiveness, and then also stoicism, um, Mm -hmm. which uh, they recommend may not be the most um, uh, helpful uh, uh, in, in a mental health sense for men. And they characterize it, you know, as as at best a so-called power through stopcat, stop stop in other words, mm-hmm. they sort of, you know, if you're a soldier at war, you could sort of stoically get through it, but at some point you're going to have to come to terms with what you saw and what you experienced. And, um, I mean, I understand that stoicism has a sort of layman's interpretation. Sure. Um, but again, uh, I look at stoicism more as a philosophy. And Mm -hmm. maybe it's just, again, focusing on individual context as opposed to sort of collective context. But for me, philosophy has always been a form of therapy. I don't see therapy as terribly helpful because philosophy has served me better. And by and by that, I simply mean that philosophy asks a lot of the big questions in life. What is meaning? What is being? uh, How to live a good life? How to act? How to live a moral life? how to deal with death, and so on and so forth. And if you spend a lot of time reading philosophy and thinking about these questions, at least in my experience, I find myself better prepared uh, to deal with the sort of vicissitudes, the mutability mutability of life. Um, That may not be the case for everybody. Obviously, I'm not going to recommend that everybody uh, start going out and reading Plato and Kant and so on (laughs) because people don't, don't have the time for that. And... They don't necessarily have to have the interest. Um, But I guess what my problem overall with the APA guidelines is that they are themselves being guided by a sort of new philosophy, if you will, or a new sort of ideology. And I um, don't mean to conflate philosophy with ideology there uh, because the point actually is to distinguish them. Um, But by that I mean social justice ideology, if you will. 
Right. And, yeah, and the I, idea and, behind. I just want to hold off on that because I have to. I have to take a little break here, and I do want to get into that because it's a really important. Um, yeah, point sure. That you're making. Okay. So I just need to let people know that this is happily ever after is just beginning on webtalkradio.net. I'm Leslie Dorries, and I'm talking with economist and writer Jonathan Church about masculinity and emotion. And the truth is, as you just heard Jonathan's wonderful explanation of how he handles emotions, we all handle them differently. And yes, we may identify similarities in groups, but that doesn't mean every characteristic applies equally to all members of that group. We're individuals, and that to me is the biggest challenge in relationships, how to deal with those individual differences. And if you're tired of struggling with how to make sense of the inherent differences between you and your partner, here's a solution. I invite you to get in touch with me and take advantage of my free, no obligation, create your happily ever after transformation session. You can send me an email at Leslie, L-E-S-L-I, at foundationscoachingnc.com, that's F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N-S, coaching, N as in Nancy, C as in Charlie.com, or you can call me at area code 919-924-0463. Again, that's 919-924-0463. And I want to get back to this conversation about masculinity masculinity, toxic masculinity, the Me Too movement, stoicism, all of this stuff that we're talking about. So, Jonathan, you're talking about um, social justice, social movements, which is what the Me Too movement is, and all of this focus on toxic masculinity and the difference between toxic masculinity and traditional masculinity, like there's one definition of it. I'm not quite sure that there is. Um, so how can Stoicism help in understanding this stuff? Um, well, we'd have to unpack what, what we mean by this stuff. Um, <laughs> but uh, because, you know, I think the primary, I, I emphasize that because I think the primary concern that I have with the social justice movement, as I would with really... Um, you know, any sort of collective activist type of movement um, mm-hmm. is that nuance really matters. Uh, yeah. And so in, in the, the, the general idea of social justice, as I understand it, um, <coughs> is that culture is something that needs to be understood and changed for the better. And by focusing on culture, you're focusing on norms, uh, collective aspects of our life uh, that may not serve us well. And so there's a primary focus on group, group identity. And so as a man, uh, as a woman, uh, you have, or woman and men, for instance, share in some aspects of lived experience. So as a man, I share in certain aspects of experience with other men that women don't and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that 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 focus on sort of group identity and the cultural aspects of our identity um, gets overemphasized as an edge, edge, uh, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, but exegetical, <laughs> e- exegetical heuristic um, for trying to understand reality. Um, mm-hmm. Now, look, I mean, we all know that on average women make 80 cents uh, for every dollar the men makes, uh, you know, that's what the data show. Um, mm-hmm. There are systemic disparities in a lot of areas of life and so on. But how you come to understand that, uh, the causes, the implications, and so on, and in this particular case, in the context of relationships and, and uh, how they lead to uh, good or bad outcomes within individual relationships, um, I think we need to be very careful uh, about how we diagnose examine, analyze um, uh, particular individual relationships uh, by uh, using these sorts of uh, social justice frameworks to sort of guide our uh, analysis of the situation. Um, And that uh, comes into fruition in these APA guidelines, which you know, I, I should say up front that I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not going to try to offer a professional assessment 
of the APA guidelines. But as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about what social justice mo me means in 2019, I see clearly the influence of social justice ideology on the APA guidelines, just in terms of the language used, the terminology, and then just, just this focus on quote unquote traditional masculinity. Um, but uh, to use the Gillette uh, example, uh, I assume most people know what I'm referring to, the controversial commercial about being uh -huh. the best, men being the best that they can be and that sort of thing. Um, uh, after that commercial came out, Mona Charon, who's a columnist, uh, wrote, you know, the basic message here is not be a better man, but to just be a decent human being. I mean, we're talking right. about people, we're talking about people coming in and, you know, not allowing kids to bully each other. Uh, about not catcalling and, and, you know, just things that are basic human decency. And, you know, and it's, so I think it's, it, the, the Gillette commercial in particular was conflating uh, a focus on basic human dis, uh, decency with some um, ideological focus on quote unquote toxic or traditional masculinity. Now relating that back to the APA, relating that back to the APA guidelines, um, you know, the APA guidelines talk about things like over-competitive, aggressive, stoicism, uh, and so on. And it, it, it's generated out of this notion of sort of, you know, patriarchy or dis systemic disparities and so on, and the idea that we can address these problems simply by focusing on cultural norms. And I'm not as convinced that simply focusing on so-called cultural norms is really the central way to go about try to, trying to deconstruct these disparities, if only because I'm not convinced that we really understand these norms as clearly and distinctly as we supposedly do. Well, and that's a really interesting point, and I think this is one of my personal areas that you know, drives me crazy because you know it's 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 part of my philosophy that you know men recently have sort of been ex excluded from the conversation of marriage that it's the idea of. Well, the key to a happy marriage is for the husband to just learn to say yes, dear, and that makes me want to go screaming into the night because that's just as discriminatory as some of these other things. And somehow, you know, in, in the Me Too movement and all these other things, it's like it's not all men. And I remember that, that coming out right after the Me Too movement that there was the hashtag not all men. And, well, you know, you know, and, and, and get pilloried and I'm going, but it isn't all men. I mean, and this is my whole point, is that, yes, there are behaviors, whether it's being done by a man, woman, a cow, I don't care who's doing the behavior, it's inappropriate behavior. Stop it. But it's not, yeah. you know, but, but, but painting, you know, painting one gender with a black brush, well, first off, we're never going to get changed that way. All we're going to get is, is defensiveness and resistance. I mean, I just had this conversation a little while ago about men you know, not, not doing their fair share around the house. It's like, well, that's not all men. And by the way, that's, you know, it's like that's, and the way to go about it isn't to attack men in general. It's like that's any more than, you know, women like being lumped all together in, in anything. It's crazy. Yeah, so to, to, compliment, to complicate this point uh, a little bit, I can remember my dentist one day telling me uh, that the key to a successful marriage is to be able to say, yes, dear. And I don't Ooh. think he meant it. I don't think he meant it, meant it in the way that you're talking about. I think he, right. he meant it. It was more of his personality, and I think he was just being, making a joke um, because that's just the way he is. Um, and, in, and in some sense, he was drawing upon sort of uh, sort of traditional or old school sort of views of marriage. Um, and, I, and by that, I don't necessarily even mean cultural views, but that, uh, I mean, look, mar marriage eventually becomes very everyday, very routine. And sure. people say, yes, dear, or whatever, uh, just as a way to get through the day. But um, I also wanted to em emphasize that, yes, there is this, this notion that listening is important. And, uh, and I agree. Uh, obviously, you have to listen uh, to what people have to say, and uh, you know there's no reason for 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 men or women or whatever to sort of just uh, uh, they should be encouraged to listen to what women have to say to to whatever. But 
listening is a necessary, not a sufficient condition for understanding. It's not yep. simply, it's not, eno- it's not enough to simply sit and listen. There needs to be spirited debate because otherwise you're sitting there listening and there's no guarantee that you're actually understanding anything. And if you go into any sort of really healthy debate, uh, academic seminar, whatever, um, there's a reason why you see spirited uh, uh, questioning and debate because it indicates healthy interest in the, um, in the topic. And you ask questions because you don't understand something. And so the idea that you sit and listen, uh, it's necessary to listen, but it's by no means sufficient for understanding. Well, and I agree because, and, and I could not agree even more to the point that that's, you know, listening is necessary but not sufficient because a lot of times people are, quote, unquote, listening only to the point where now I can contradict or, or, or do a counterpoint or as opposed to listening to understand, which is what you're talking about. It's like, because, and the only way we're going to make any progress in any of this is to listen to other people's experiences, not from a place of judgment, but, oh, my gosh, you have lived a different life than I have, so you're going to experience things differently, and I would really like to, you know, try to see the world from, from your perspective. And by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean it's, quote unquote right but it's right because it's what you experience now and I think this may be where stoicism can come into play is that there are multiple interpretations of a particular incident Uh, yes Uh, go ahead go ahead well I I I just want to make sure I wasn't uh, intruding on a flow of thought there Mm -mm. I thought you were done but I wasn't sure no, that's fine. But I mean, this, but this idea that, that, you know, you've had a different experience than I have. And how do I acknowledge that? And the idea that, like I said, there's multiple interpretations. And one of the things that I try to do and try to tell people to do is, can you, are you willing to choose the most positive interpretation? And unfortunately, and I think this may be what you were talking about a little bit in the article about social justice, is that you know, no, I, you know, so traditional masculinity or whatever, you know, it's all bad. It's like, how can it be all bad? That's, that's, that's a ridiculous statement. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not sure that uh, I, I, if I had to guess, if anybody is very much adamant about soci- social justice ideology or is active in those circles and is listening to this, I, I would be, um, I'd be willing to guess that they are probably saying that that's not what the that's not the idea. Uh, the, the idea is not to say that all men are bad or to sort of make these sort of rash collective judgments about um, about men. But I think they would very much agree with you about the idea that there are multiple interpretations and multiple perspectives. Um, and there's a, a certain sense in which I agree with that. There's a certain sense in which I don't agree with that. And and I think I can. I can boil it down to the idea that um, perspective is not the same thing as truth. So I often hear from people who are sort of um, uh, engaged in this sort of activist uh, social justice mindset or uh, circle. Uh, if I make an argument and I say uh, one reaction that I get is that's according to you or that there are multiple truths um, or that uh, you have your own truth. And I think that that's a conflation of the idea of truth with the idea of interpretation or perspective. There certainly mm-hmm. can be multiple perspectives, but you go into a courtroom to resolve a, a case in litigation with the idea that you can come to some kind of um, judgment, uh, some kind of conclusion about the matter after laying out all the facts and the two or how, you know, the, the parties to, this, to the dispute are able to lay out their case. Now, of course, sometimes the judgments turn out to be wrong, but the idea here, the implication here, is that there is, in fact, a right and wrong, uh, and that it's hard work to figure out what is what is uh, what is uh, right. Um, mm-hmm. So, I guess just to recap- recapitulate there, I think that I can agree with what I think would be the reaction of a sort of I don't know, representative social justice activist that mm-hmm. 
it's not so simple to say, well, all men are bad or all men are this or that. Um, but we do have to focus on group identity, sort of aspects of collective experience. And in doing so, recognize that, you know, uh, truth is not just a matter of either or or whatever, but that there are multiple, multiple interpretations and perspectives. And that's obviously true. But there's a danger in conflating perspective with truth. I mean, sure. uh, you know, we can, we can think of the obvious examples, two plus two and all that, but the idea is there is right and there is wrong. Well, and I, and I do think that that's one of the, the ways that we as a society and even within our own relationships we struggle with because trying to identify that, and yes, we have, I mean, there are lots of things that allow society to continue to move forward, whether all of them are good or not, that's a different question, I think, and, you know, and whether or not they are worthy of reevaluation or doing things differently, because, you know, we, we evolve, and one of the only ways, and we were just talking about this a little bit ago, the only way that we can continue to evolve in a healthy way is to be willing to listen to each other. And not listen to argue, but listen to understand. And yes, you know, uh, I agree. Yeah, we we. But again, I want to emphasize the issue is, uh, and and I and I, I this is a point that I actually consider to be very very important um, because I think that uh, one theme that you hear over and over is we need to just listen. And of course, uh, who would disagree with that other than just sort of some obstinate polemicist. Uh, but, uh, but listening is, is not sufficient. To be able Correct. to simply say, I guess since we're talking about men or whatever, the idea that you simply have to be a man and sit and listen, you know, shut up or whatever. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. okay, fine, uh, I'll sit and shut up, but I can't guarantee you that I understand what you're saying if you don't allow me to ask questions when I reach when I arrive at a point that I'm a little confused and so there has to be a, a spirited back and forth and not simply uh, a shut up and listen approach oh, oh I could not agree with you more because that's because then again that to me that's just as disrespectful <laughs> it's like okay I'll, I'll hear your words but if you if you give me that that framework, I'm not necessarily going to be open to, to, you know, a, I don't want to say yeah. accepting your viewpoint, but at least being open to it if, if I'm not being, and that's part of my issue, you know, uh, going back to the, the whole thing about, you know, men just learning to say yes here. And I, and by the way, I'm a proponent of saying yes as often as possible in a relationship, whether it's a parent, child, husband, wife, friends, whatever, because I think we all, you know, the more positive experiences we have in relationships, the better. I don't think people should just say yes to keep the peace because that generally doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I am a big proponent of saying yes, and if you can mean it, <laughs> but don't say yes if yeah. you can't. That, and, you know, that to me is that whole thing about men not being included in, in their relationships and this whole idea that, they don't that they don't bring anything to the table, which I mean to me is just incredibly insulting. Because flip it, you know, do the you know do mm -hmm. the otherism. You say that women don't bring anything to the table. That's not really acceptable either. Um, so yeah, you can. Def Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, that's okay. I mean, we're 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 right about at the end of time. So I wanted to make sure that I gave you the opportunity to share in um, contact information where people can learn mo more about what stoicism really is and the fact that just because somebody is stoic doesn't mean that they don't have emotions, they just handle them in a different way, which I think is critically important um, for everybody to understand. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, so I can certainly refer to my website, which just has a list of publications. It's just www jonathandavidchurch.com um, and if you want to wade through all the writings and uh, you're welcome to do that um, <laughs> and I think the, the general point that I simply want to convey to end though is that um, that I think that uh, I suppose to anchor on your point about whether it's disrespectful 
I'm not so concerned about the idea of saying of whether telling me to listen is disrespectful to me. I'm really ultimately concerned with just uh, rational inquiry, objective in inquiry, which, by the way, is not the same thing as neutrality. I care about engaging with ideas, facts, and honestly trying to arrive at some uh, glimpse of the truth. And okay. that's ultimately what my concern is, is intellectual integrity, intellectual honesty, and not polemics, not factionalization, tribalism, uh, and taking things personally. Well, and I think that's I think that's great advice because you know emotions really are neither good nor bad. They're merely a form of information. And yeah, I like that. That's true. Yeah, and we can't. I, not I like that very much. Even, even if we wanted to, they're they're part of who we are. So, you know, it's how these emotions are handled that's productive or unproductive, <coughs> and be, being ruled by your emotions or repressing them are equally problematic. Learning how to manage and respond to them is a much healthier path forward. So a lot of the questions that people have to ask is, what role do emotions play in your own behavior, and how does this impact your relationship? And hopefully today, with the introduction to stoicism, we've got another alternative. And I hope that you'll keep listening to the show to keep learning more. And until next week, stay loving. Stay loving.